Thank you, welcome. On behalf of Crossroads, it's a pleasure to have our guest tonight. You know, when we, just to motivate the discussion, when we were making the program for this conversation, we were trying to think of what's going on in the public conversation in America, and certainly the last year or so, there is a big return of attention to the theme of liberalism. You know, everybody has been talking about liberalism, and often they have not been talking about it in very precise terms. You know, there has been a series of books. You can think of the book by Deneen, then there is this whole neo-integralist movement on the Catholic side of things, uh, which makes anti-liberalism one of its banners. Uh, many people have been talking about liberalism as kind of the foil of what they call populism, uh, or at least they've been associating liberalism with elitism. So the name has been going around and being used for many purposes. And again, often it's not being used in very precise terms, so I thought it would be, it would be nice to have a conversation about is the, what does the word mean at this point? What is liberalism? and uh, what role it plays, if anything, at this point in the political life. Um, and one thing that came to our attention is the book by Fred Siegel, who is a book, The Revolt Against the Masses, which is a book precisely about liberalism, but Fred makes a, uses the word in another precise sense. Okay? For him, liberalism, I mean, he's going to talk about it, but liberalism is specifically an important American political movement that started around World War I is not everything that happened since the Enlightenment. It's not just uh, certain politicians that you can listen to today, but it's a, as a precise sense. Okay, So I th we thought it would be very helpful to have Fred Siegel tell us about the history of liberalism in the sense of American political history. But of course, after we talk about that, we can also use that as an excuse to broaden the conversation. Okay, So the way we are going to do this is that Fred Siegel is going to talk about his book, then Paul Bauman is going to respond, and then we're going to have a conversation. So then we just to introduce our speakers. Uh, Fred Siegel is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. He's the former editor of the City Journal, and now a contributing editor. He's an expert on market-friendly public policy solutions for urban governance, and he's a professor emeritus of history at Cooper Union, where he taught for many years. And now he's a scholar in residence at St. Francis College. He's the author of the book, Revolt Against the Masses, How Liberalism Has Undermined the Middle Class. He has published frequently in the New Republic, the Atlantic, Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Weekly Standard, and Washington Post. Paul Bauman is the editor of Commonweal, although he just told me that he's about to step down after tonight. So this is his last public appearance as the editor of Commonweal. So we are very... We are, we are very honored and pleased to have this occasion. Uh, as you know, Commonweal is, is an independent lay Catholic journal of opinion founded in 1924. He previously worked as a newspaper editorial writer and a reporter, and his writing has, pub has appeared in many publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Monthly, the Columbia Journalism Review, Slate, and the Wall Street Journal. He was educated at Wesleyan University and Yale Divinity School. Okay, so thank you both, and let's welcome Fred Siegel first. If, uh, if, is it more comfortable to sit up? Or if, 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 if you don't, can, can I sit? If, if Whatever is best. If, if, can people hear me? Okay. When you use the mic. When I use the mic, okay. I'll, I'll use the mic. Um, I don't want to talk at all tonight about either Obama or Trump. I want to go back to the origins of modern liberalism. And modern liberalism begins not in the New Deal. Most people assume it begins in the New Deal. It doesn't. It begins in the 1920s. And it begins with a group of writers and novelists Microphone a little closer. Oh, a little closer, okay. If, if it begins with a, a people you heard, how many people, just curious, how many how many people have, have read H.L. Mencken, the journalist, the famous journalist? What about H.G. Wells? Okay, you, you, the Invisible Man, right. uh, uh, The Time Machine, 
uh, War of the Worlds. Wells was an enormously important influence in Anglo-American intellectual life and is one of the founders of modern liberalism in the 1920s. And the third figure I'll talk about a little bit is Sinclair Lewis. How many people have heard of him? It can't happen here. Which gets reissued with a new introduction every 10 years. Paul Krugman writes about it every, every three or four years. Well, actually, he writes about it every almost every column, but in, in different variations. Um, what happens is that in the wake of World War One, uh, these new writers storm the literary world. They transform the literary world. The most important of these writers I haven't mentioned because I'm not going to talk about him. Uh, uh, tonight, that's F. Scott Fitzgerald, and you've all re you've all read him, but he has the least impact politically. Mencken, not even think, thought of as a liberal, he has the most impact. He has an enormous impact on the generation that comes of age in the 1920s and the 1930s. Mencken hates America. Not a matter of, I'm not being uh, ex you know, excessive when I say that. Mencken rooted against America in World War I. He supported, he loved, he, how many people saw a Wonder Woman? Wonder Woman, the, the, the bad guy in Wonder Woman is Ludendorff. Mencken loves Ludendorff. Uh, Mencken, Mencken despises democracy. He writes about the bourgeoisie. He hates the middle classes. He wants America to be more like Germany. He wants what he wants in America is an aristocracy. He's a Nietzschean, and he writes a book about why democracy is disastrous. And the embarrassing thing is the only person who gives him unstinting praise is the Kaiser, who's then in exile. Mencken is an important figure in a, in a movie you may have seen called Inherit the Wind. It's about the Scopes trial. Do people know what the Scopes trial was? Well, it, it, most people know about Inherit, the Scopes trial through Inherit the Wind, a 1954 play which is put on it regularly. Ed Asner, who was the star, one of the stars of, of the Mary Tyler Moore Show, a, a show some of the older people will, will remember, and if you're, if you're younger, your parents uh, enjoyed it in the early 70s. Mary Tyler Moore was the first yuppie. In, in Inherit the Wind, uh, this town fil filled with yahoos uh, takes this guy throws him in jail for teaching about evolution, threatens his life. It's a horrible trial. The town is filled with miscreants, gap-toothed morons. None of this is true. What happened was as follows. There was a so-called Butler Law in Tennessee. You can't teach evolution. Nobody paid any attention to it. Evolution was taught. The town saw an opportunity to promote itself. The ACLU, which was formed a few years earlier, saw, saw an opportunity to promote itself. And they decided, they decided to have a test a trial. They, they, they put this fellow on trial, nothing much would happen. The town would get a lot of publicity, the ACLU would get a lot of publicity, and everyone would have a good time. But it got out of hand. People from all over the country began. <coughs> and up until this point, there wasn't an enormous amount of tension between religion and politics. None of what's come in the, in the 
generation since. Not only was he not thrown in jail, he was a hell fellow well met. The prosecution was carried out by a fellow named William Jennings Bryan, three times Democratic candidate for President of the United States, a pacifist who had opposed World War I. And rather than being foolish fellow, he was widely read and generally generally widely tolerant. The defense was carried out by the great defense lawyer Clarence Darrow. Now Darrow was looking to reclaim his reputation. He had been the lawyer for Leopold and Loeb. How many people know who Leopold and Loeb were? They were the, they were the young Jewish children of millionaires who carried out the Bobby Franks murder. And they were, they were Nietzscheans. They thought that they, they could carry out the perfect murder. And their lawyer, Darrow, defended, defended them on, on grounds that they didn't really understand what they were doing. He invoked Nietzsche to defend them. Well, Brian jumped on this and said, I'm sorry, somebody, you're gesturing? You want the shade? The shade on the sun. Oh, the sun. Oh. I don't, want, I, don't want, I don't want to go too far into the weeds on this. There's a very good book on the scope of trial by a man named Edward Larson. The important thing here is that modern American liberalism is shaped by the Scopes trial, by the idea that Brian was a fool, that the Scopes trial involved gap-toothed gap -tooth morons, who were the people who Mencken, in his coverage of the, of the trial, called the bourgeoisie. And Mencken was a, a fantastic journalist, very funny, very clever, very effective. And if you were a college student in the 20s, you wanted to be like Mencken. You admired Mencken. You wanted to wanted to be able to write like him. Mencken fell out of favor in the 30s because he opposed the New Deal. And he, got, he, he, he mocked Roosevelt and paid the political price. But in the 1920s, he was riding high. So that's two of the three people I mentioned. Mencken, Sinclair Lewis. And Sinclair, Lewis. God, thank you. I didn't actually I didn't get to Sinclair Lewis. Thanks, Eamon. So the second is Sinclair Lewis, who wrote Main Street. Has any, any of you read any of Sinclair Lewis? It can't ha it can't happen here. Main Street, Babbitt. Sinclair Lewis uh, is, is enormously significant. His Main Street uh, is the biggest political novel in America since Uncle Tom's Cabin. It's an event, and it, what, it, what it says is the people who live on Main Street are suffering from the village virus. That's what he calls it. And it's about a woman named Carol Kennicott who is, leads a terribly sad life because her husband is a bore. If that, if that con constitutes sadness, my wife should be terribly sad. Um, uh, and. She needs more, more zest in her life. And it's because she lives in a small town, uh, much like the one that, that 
Lewis grew up in, uh, it's, it's a terrible life, it's a terrible fate. And the, the problem with people who lived in these towns is that they're content. And if you think I'm joking, I'm not. They're content, they shouldn't be content. <coughs> They need, they need to be more resentful, angrier, more interesting. These are the themes that will, will be carried on in the post-war years by a historian some of you know by the name of Richard Hofstadter. <coughs> Sinclair Lewis then writes a novel called Babbitt, and babbitry becomes a, a, a metaphor for dull business people. Pe people who just are, who aren't very interesting. In, in the 30s he writes, it can't happen here, which is about how the Rotary Clubs, and if you think I'm joking, please read it, the Rotary Clubs bring fascism to America. You can't, you can't make this up. And some of it is sarcasm, some of it's satire, most of it's written in utter seriousness. It can't happen here, it gets issued and reissued and reissued. Then there's Wells. Wells meets with every American president from Theodore Roosevelt the Franklin Roosevelt. And Wells convinces liberals who come of age after World War I that they, have, they own the future. They understand the future. That they understand the arc of history. And he writes a, he writes a book which outlines, as he sees it, he writes a book called The Outline of History in the early 20s, which is a mega, mega bestseller, uh, which describes, it as, as he understands it, the course of history. It doesn't look very good in retrospect. I read it as a teenager 50, 50 70 years ago, not, not quite that long, 60 years ago, 60, 55 years ago, <laughs> let, 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 me, let me be precise. Uh, Wells, the most important book Wells wrote was a book called Anticipations. Wells sees, the, how te sees how technology is transforming the world. How the telegraph and the telephone will transform the nature of communications and the nature of politics. <coughs> Wells is a big eugenicist, as is Clarence Darrow. Brian is a great opponent of eugenicism. Liberalism is born along with eugenics. So what is liberalism about in the 1920s? It's people who see, think they have a patent on the future. They're cleverer and smarter than the Babbitts and the bourgeoisie. But mostly, they're people who think that their expertise gives them the right to govern, that democracy is inadequate. That government should be carried out by a new aristocracy, an aristocracy of intelligence, by a regulatory state, <coughs> and not by a self-governing people. They have no use whatsoever for Jeffersonian democracy, no use whatsoever for the Constitution. They see themselves as the natural aristocracy. And they see the colleges as the natural church of this new aristocracy. Cause on two more minutes? Two more minutes, okay. That's good. Uh, <clears throat> liberalism is fully formed before the New Deal. Before the New Deal. And the New Deal form of liberalism, which is soft social democracy, 
exists from about the 1930s through the 1960s. This older form of liberalism is there from right after World War I to the present. What sets into motion, I'll, I'll conclude with this. Woodrow Wilson, who's our president during World War I, is enormously authoritarian. The American Civil Liberties Union has a good case to make. And it's a, it's a reaction in part to the authoritarianism of World War I. But it's much more than that. It's an attempt to overthrow the American Constitution, <coughs> American ideals of self-government, and American democracy, and to create a new aristocracy. For a while, for about 40 years, it has a social democratic flavor. But by the end of the 1960s, that's overthrown as well. And what we go back to is the idea that, that an intelligent elite should govern the rest of us. Anyway, is that okay. Next stop. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I think I'll try without the microphone, and if you can't hear, just uh, speak up. Uh, and uh, thank you, Fred. Uh, thank you, uh, Carlo. Um, uh, needless to say, this is uh, not how I thought my retirement party would be unfolding. Uh, but um, since Carlo was kind enough to uh, write an article for Commonweal, I, uh, I was grateful, and I felt I, I owed him one. Uh, so here I am. Um, let me begin with a few cautions. Uh, when Carlo asked me to participate in a discussion of Fred's book, I warned him that I'm not a historian or a scholar. I'm a journalist and an editor. Uh, in other words, a generalist. So in a certain sense, I would not be able to evaluate the accuracy of the book's <coughs> historical claims or the use it makes of scholarly sources. Carlo insisted that our discussion would focus more broadly on questions about liberalism, a subject on which Carlo and I have had a sometimes mutually uncomprehending email correspondence. Alas, I'm not an expert on liberalism either, although some of my political views can be described as liberal. Liberalism, in any event, is notoriously difficult to define. Like most political ideologies, it has different and sometimes contradictory strains. It is a historical movement with many ideas and forces, both convergent and conflicting. For instance, there is neoliberalism, communitarian liberalism, classical liberalism. <clears throat> there was once even a species called liberal republicans. They are now extinct. <laughs> My liberalism as editor of Commonweal, for example, is not the same as the liberalism of the nation. Forced to label my politics, I guess I would describe myself as a liberal centrist who believes in limited government and the separation of powers, but also in the good, <clears throat> in the good that government can do, not only to protect public safety and the nation, but also in advancing human rights, social justice, and economic fairness, or what used to be called the common good. I believe that democracy exists to safeguard individual freedom and liberty, and that an essential aspect of guaranteeing that freedom is to protect citizens from the imposition of arbitrary power, whether that power is egregious concentrations of wealth or the unwarranted intrusion of government itself. Writing about Abraham Lincoln's political faith in the pages of Commonweal, the philosopher Jeffrey Stout put it this way, to possess Republican freedom is not to be able to do whatever one wants, but rather to be part of a society, all members of which are constrained by wisely chosen and justly enforced norms. Leaders and citizens alike are free because laws of the right kind bind them. A just legal order and a virtuous citizenry are interdependent. The laws neither make nor enforce themselves, but need help from citizens. The task of ethical formation, the task of ethical formation become all the more pressing in a democracy, which extends the status of citizen to a large, potentially volatile group. A democratic republic can become and remain a society of laws in the full sense then, only if it is also a society 
of relatively virtuous citizens. In other words, I believe that we can achieve a good in common that we cannot realize individually. That is one reason why commonweal is called common wheel. We believe an innate hostility to government is not a democratic virtue. It is my impression that Fred shares my convictions about democracy and the responsibilities of citizenship, even if we disagree about what is the greater danger or threat to both. I have been an avid reader and admire Fred's political writing. As mentioned, Fred was a frequent contributor to Commonweal in the 1980s and early 1990s. That was before he abandoned Commonweal's masses for the elitist battlements of the Manhattan Institute. <laughs> Fred's writing for Commonweal was characterized by a refreshing sense that neither political party was addressing the real concerns of the electorate, although he gave special attention to the failures of the Democrats, then his native tribe. His prose was vigorous, his analysis sharp-eyed and unsentimental. He had a keen sense of history's ironies and unexpected reversals, and a real appetite for political combat. He has always been a fierce critic of dubious liberal pieties, and a staunch defender of family, community, faith, and bourgeois values properly understood. Values, I might add, that I certainly share as a suburban homeowner and father of three. Fred championed hard work, social and economic mobility, trade unionism, and sexual probity. He was also a fearless critic of racialized politics, especially as practiced in cities such as New York and on college campuses. I greatly admired Fred's willingness to hold up the ideal of integration and the calibrated use of affirmative action when the black power movement was championing racial separation. I was reminded of these gutsy stands when I came across a reference in the revolt against the masses to what life was like at Wesleyan University in the 1970s. Um, Senator Daniel Moynihan's son John, a student at Wesleyan, captured the mood, Fred writes. He described Wesleyan, which would move into the vanguard of campus multiculturalism, as an overgrown playground where Westchester Marxists drove daddy's car to the protest and conversation focused on feminism and boycotting Nestle. As it happens, I graduated from Westland a few years before John Moynihan. Although it is a cliche and inaccurate to describe the wealthy undergraduates at elite colleges as Marxists, most, after all, are on their way to medical or law school, not to the barricades, it is not inaccurate to say that multiculturalism and racial, <laughs> racial politics were a problem. During my years at Wesleyan, racial, political, and cultural divisions were deep, and the recent deliberation that lies at the heart of higher education, and one hopes at the heart of democratic life, often proved impossible. To be sure, it was a time convulsed by the Vietnam War, the draft, a corrupt president who resigned before he was impeached, the black power and women's movements, the pill and the sexual revolution, and the widespread acceptance of drug use on college campuses. It was, in other words, a crazy and perplexing time. In the spring of my freshman year, President Nixon invaded Cambodia. Four students were shot dead while protesting at Kent State. And a student strike shut down colleges and universities across the country, including my own. Wesleyan was well known as <clears throat> for its freewheeling, hyper-individualistic undergraduate culture. The university conceived of its educational mission in progressive and explicitly liberal terms. How liberal? Well, it did not come as a surprise to me when, years later, the college became notorious for establishing a clothing optional dorm. I'm not kidding. As Fred and I agree, if choice is regarded as the ultimate and defining liberal value, what people choose cannot be questioned. The university was also known for its commitment to racial equality. That was an impressive and inspiring legacy, and certainly a draw for me. 20% of my classmates were minorities, the vast majority African American. Minority representation at other traditionally white liberal arts colleges rarely exceeded 5%. Not much thought or preparation, however, had gone into how what was still an essentially elite white institution would deal 
of the cultural and political misunderstandings that inevitably arose between blacks and whites. The Black Panthers were a presence on campus, and tensions sometimes ran quite high. There were fights and incidents with guns, knives, and even arson. Racial strife had troubled the campus for years, prompting a cover story in the New York Times Magazine. It was titled, The Two Nations at Wesleyan University. With rare exceptions, the Times reported, white students and black students do not even talk to each other. That was true. Black students felt a strong imperative to separatism. Solomon, the Times reporter concluded, would have been overwhelmed at Wesleyan. And I can report it was often very overwhelming. If a liberal institution committed to doing its part to redress the historical sins of racism could fail so conspicuously, what hope was there for racial progress in less sympathetic settings? I witnessed several violent and very disturbing incidents that shook my faith in the institution and its values. As far as I could tell, no one was held accountable for his behavior. These experiences convinced me that what is often called liberal tolerance is just neglect, indifference, or moral cowardice. The result was not a flowering of cooperation and fellow feeling. No, the result was a competitive free-for-all, the school's liberalism quickly unschooling into a faddish libertarianism. By the time I graduated, I was doubtful that this sort of liberalism was capable of delivering on the big questions in life. What is right and what is wrong? What do we owe one another as persons and as citizens? Why are we here? What is our destiny? I perceived, if inchoately, that my liberal convictions needed a much firmer moral foundation than the secular academy was offering. But as I noted earlier, modern liberalism is not just one thing. Wesleyan's liberalism is not the only liberalism on offer. Much to my surprise, I began to suspect that even the outlandish and seemingly anachronistic claims of Catholicism might offer an alternative. That Catholicism might even be true, and that liberalism might need Catholicism's moral resources if it were to right itself. I don't want to underestimate the difficulties faced by the faculty and administration in handling the racial and political unrest of the times. Almost no institution got it right. But I left college looking to engage thinkers who could answer my questions about the relationship between morality, religion, and liberal democracy. And that search eventually brought me to Commonweal, where liberalism resides relatively comfortably, too comfortably, our critics might say, with biblical faith, church doctrine, a belief in reason, and in the necessity of civil discourse. As I hope my story about Wesleyan indicates, I agree with certain aspects of Fred's diagnosis of the nation's political and cultural problems. However, I do not share either his pessimism over what afflicts modern liberalism or his prescription for the cure, a prescription that seems to be a recommendation that the patient be put out of his misery. Liberalism, broadly understood after all, has some hard to ignore accomplishments. There's the US Constitution, the abolition of slavery, the enfranchisement of women, the New Deal, the defeat of fascist and communist totalitarianism, the civil rights movement, just to name a few. It even helped the Catholic Church embrace religious liberty. Liberalism may yet help provide answers to the distortions now crippling our politics. In his book, Fred spends a lot of time denouncing the snobbery of the liberal elites, and even argues that such snobbery is endemic to liberalism and the privileged status of its advocates. I'm drying up here, so I'm going to have to pause. Are some self-identified liberals intellectual and cultural snobs? Of course. It's my experience, however, that snobbery and elitism exist across the ideological spectrum. Moreover, Many of the intellectuals Fred builds his argument around, people like Randolph Bourne, H.L. Mencken, H.G. Wells, Dwight MacDonald, Edmund Wilson, Susan Sontag, would hardly describe themselves as liberals. MacDonald and Bourne were radicals. Wilson, at one time, 
and apologists for Stalinism. Most of them exhibited a good deal of contempt for so-called liberals. In his search for a more humane alternative to the industrial age, Born, I believe, was even drawn to a certain kind of medieval Catholic corporatism. Odder, it seems to me, is that when Fred wants to emphasize the radical and subversive nature of so-called liberalism, he enlists as allies figures such as Edmund Muskie, Hubert Humphrey, and Arthur Schlesinger Jr., all of whom consider themselves mainstream, mainstream liberals in good standing, and all of whom wanted to guide liberalism towards what Schlesinger famously called the vital center, a center, I might add, vehemently condemned by leftists. As Fred acknowledges, Schlesinger's liberalism was empirical, pragmatic, and incremental. I would argue that the liberalism of the past hundred years has more often been empirical, pragmatic, and incremental than Fred allows. Do liberals need to combat the ideological extremism of some of their allies? Certainly. Does modern liberalism cast a more critical eye on capitalism and on what Fred describes as traditional middle-class values, as well as on America's proud celebration of individualism than conservatives do? Yes, it does. Is mainstream liberalism out to overthrow capitalism and destroy the family, as Fred insists? Again, I think such ambitions belong to a noisy fringe, elements of which unfortunately dominate facets of popular culture. When it comes to capitalism and traditional values, I think it is more accurate to describe liberals as a loyal opposition, with the emphasis on loyal. Has modern liberalism focused too much on individual rights and personal autonomy, neglecting the duties and responsibilities that come with citizenship? Has it downplayed the essential role stable families play in forming virtuous citizens, the, forming the virtuous citizens democracy depends on? Yes, I think those are fair criticisms. But those are sins also evident on the right, where economic libertarianism increasingly holds sway. Am I concerned with the direction modern liberalism sometimes takes? Yes. I would argue, however, that a better outcome may rest on critiques and wisdom that come from more sympathetic friends of liberalism. We live in a constantly changing, deeply materialistic consumer culture. Most people spend most of their time working and much of their free time anxious about economic security. It is inevitable that the utilitarian values of the marketplace will shape many of our decisions as individuals. I would endorse something Fred wrote in Commonweal many years ago. Liberals, he wrote, having finally grown sensitive to the inroads conservatives have made in playing on the fears of family breakdown, have argued that the chief threat to the family is the caprice of the market and not the impositions of the new class. Behaviorally, they're right. Market and corporate decisions can destroy communities and uproot families on a scale grander than that of the most purblind Washington planner. And inflation has done far more to pull women away from their children than feminism. One important question raised by Fred's indictment in his book is whether liberalism properly understood has the resources to reinvigorate our efforts to articulate and pursue the common good. In her forthcoming book, The Lost History of Liberalism, historian Hel <coughs> Helena Rosenblatt reminds us, and I quote, that most liberals were moralists. Their liberalism had nothing to do with atomistic individualism. They never spoke about rights without stressing duties. They always rejected the idea that a viable community could be constructed on the basis of self-interestedness alone. Ad infinitum, they warmed warned of the dangers of selfishness. Liberals ceaselessly advocated generosity, moral probity, and civic values. The idea that liberalism is an Anglo-American tradition concerned primarily with the protection of individual rights and interests is a very recent development. It is the product of the wars of the 20th century, and especially the fear of totalitarianism during the Cold War. For centuries before this, being liberal meant a giving and civic-minded citizen. It meant understanding one's connectedness to other citizens and acting in ways conducive to the common good. In the mid-20th century, the American philosopher John Dewey still insisted that liberalism stood for liberality and generosity, 
especially of mind and character. It had nothing to do, he said, with the gospel of individualism. Which brings me finally to a question I would be interested in hearing Fred respond to. In the revolt of the masses, you condemn and dismiss writers such as Sinclair Lewis, who ridiculed middle-class lives and ambitions, who ridiculed the middle-class lives and ambitions of most Americans. It is this assault by the so-called elites on the capitalist aspirations of the middle class that you find particularly obnoxious and anti-democratic. I have considerable sympathy for this point of view. I come from several generations of middle class strivers, and I think of myself as the lucky beneficiary of the material progress brought about by the modern economy. I'm a believer in America's claim to have lifted millions of immigrants and others out of poverty. But, as a Catholic, there are complications. My faith tells me that a life of getting and spending, or of accumulating an ungodly amount of money, can be a snare and an illusion. Such a tight focus on family and career may also be an obstacle to the formation of virtuous citizens. My faith also warns me about the dangers of self-seeking and, and a constricted individualism. There are many passages in scripture that take a rather dim view of the wealthy, and even a few that might be called anti-family. Scripture rather emphatically tells me that I will be judged by how I treat the poor. That, I would argue, is also a tenet of liberalism at its best, and certainly a core belief at common good. To be sure, not all of us are called to give up all our worldly possessions, or at least that is what my church tells me. But we are called to take responsibility for the whole, for the general welfare, and not just for ourselves and our immediate family. Fred's celebration of middle-class ambition and American individualism feeds into an interesting argument about U.S. Catholicism. There are those on both the Catholic left and right who think that to the extent the Catholics have uncritically embraced the values of our consumer culture, they have necessarily abandoned their faith. You cannot, as the saying goes, serve two masters. Now, as an empirical, pragmatic, and incremental liberal, and as a Catholic, I am naturally of two minds about this. Do I think the economic success of Catholics in America is something to lament? No, I do not. I am personally grateful for it. Do I think that the American worship of money and success is a kind of idolatry? I certainly do. So in the end, I think it is a good thing that my church insists on questioning the American values Fred is so keen to vindicate. I want to be chastened when I am tempted, as I usually am, to ignore the poor or to lionize society's winners. I don't think such moralizing from my church or even from liberals undermines, middle, undermines the middle class. I think it strengthens those values of duty, responsibility, and loyalty that middle class life and democracy depend on. I'm all for defending traditional middle class aspirations, but our moral aspirations must not end there. I think you can challenge America at the same time that you celebrate it. Thank you. So now we have some time for questions. So we'll just get a few questions and then we can open to the audience. Uh, you had a question. What was your question again? <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me just uh, uh, briefly respond to Paul. Uh, Paul, if there were more liberals like you, I'd be more positive toward liberalism. Uh, however, I'm reproducing as fast as I can. <laughs> uh, however, um, you're a dwindling minority. Your sort of liberalism has been dying off and, and, and dying off fairly rapidly in the last 25 years. Um, there's a question of, of, of deal with the, just one question. I, there's too many elements to, to, to go into. I, I, we, we, we've, we've spent 50 years with, in po with poverty programs, putting money into the inner city. 50 years of failure. We haven't been willing to look at things empirically. Uh, 
we haven't been, we haven't been able to been willing to look at things in any any kind of practical way. Um, worse than that, the rise of public sector unions transformed the nature of American politics. Public private unions were were connected to the overall well-being of the society. If, 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 if the steel company, if the country did well, the steel company did well. And this was traditional Hamiltonianism. But globalization destroyed that. And both people on either the left and the right understood that in the 2016 election. I didn't want to talk about that, but now I'll talk about it for a second. <laughs> Nobody in this past election, other than Donald J. Trump, who I did not work for, did not vote for, rather, because he stole a quarter of a million dollars from a friend of mine, got it. The traditional Hamiltonian notion that business, the well-being of business and the well-being of America were closely connected, that, that, that had been broken by globalization. But what, what happened to liberalism was, the liberalism had disappeared. What replaced it was a very extreme version of what people began to call progressivism. This is what Hillary Clinton called it. And what progressivism was, was race, class, and gender to the extreme. This is what pushed me away from the kind of centrist liberalism that you represented and, and which is enormously decent and appealing. Let me fin let's just finish with this point. <coughs> that this kind of progressivism has no future. Its response to Trump's victory has to simply been double down. I spend the winters in California, just a matter of temperature. The people I talk to in California, especially in Hollywood, where my sister is a screenwriter, are positively insane. <laughs> They've learned absolutely nothing. They think if you're Robert De Niro and you curse, you, you, and you curse uh, Trump, and by the way, De Niro's cursing Trump and people applauding for five minutes is already being made into an ad for, for Trump. They think that that's that's a good thing. There's no there's no future in those in that politics. And that politics, whether Paul agrees with it or not, and I know he doesn't, is what passes for le left wing or progressive politics. Let's not call it liberal anymore. I don't think liberalism exists anymore, except in, in, important, in, in important outposts, but do, important but dwindling outposts. Anyway, let me stop. In a sense, there is liberalism does not exist anymore, but on the other hand, in the book you trace back this kind of progressivism to the Kantian Nietzsche philosophy of the people in the 1920s. So in some sense, it prevailed. How did it come to prevail? Why did it prevail? You know, there was the 60s. In your book, you know, the 60s seems to be an interesting time. How, how it came to be that this form of kind of minority elite liberalism came to dominate the American left in some sense? Well, well that answers What happens during Vietnam is that uh, upper middle class uh, Republicans uh, become anti-war anti and they, they adopt uh, what, we, what we thought of then as liberal values. Very little has changed since 1972. In 1972, the McGovern, I worked for McGovern in 72, I actually I drove him around in western Pennsylvania. I got to know McGovern. I was stupefied at his, at his limitations. 
he thought he thought that, that Henry Wallace had been right in 1948. If that any if that means anything to some of you, the Communist Party candidate for president of the United States. In 1972, the Democratic Party decided it would, it would select delegates based on race, class, and gender. And we've been on a downhill slide in this regard ever since. The other thing that happened in the 1960s was there, there was this loss, loss of Reason lost its appeal. We, we were we were going to transcend reason with drugs. I didn't do it. I was too dull. Uh, but people people were going to we going to get past all this. You didn't have to reason with, reason with other people. You would if you were if I, I, some of you must have read Tom Wolfe, the lecture Kool Aid Acid Test. If you haven't, it's worth a, it's worth a read. Except the last forty pages, which make no sense. But read it. It's worth it's worth reading. It's about Ken Kesey, the magic. What was the what was the bus called? Magic Yellow. Magic. Magic Yellow bus. It, it, it's it's a it's a it's a it's, you, it's a very good introduction to the '60s and drugs. And people uh, uh, people lost it, and in some sense, uh, never it never returned to it. The combination of drugs in Vietnam and elitism. Uh, was, was, a, was a terrible cocktail, which we've never fully absorbed. So I, that's a very quick an answer. Uh, just, uh, just a couple of things. Um, uh, I, I don't think uh, I certainly agree that uh, globalism has uh, has done a job on, on, uh, on the labor movement. But I don't think uh, you can discount the fact that uh, corporate America has had a 45-year attack on private sector labor unions, and they've succeeded uh, with, the, with the most recent Supreme Court ruling uh, about right to work laws. It's a, it's a, it's a done deal. It hasn't happened yet. No, it hasn't happened, but it will. <laughs> um, you talking uh, the Janus? Yes, the Janus. Um, secondly, uh, Mark Lilla, um, uh, who's a philosopher at Columbia now, uh, wrote a very interesting article uh, back in the late 1990s called A Tale of Two Reactions. Uh, and he was responding both to the cultural revolution of the 1960s and then to the Reagan revolution of the 1980s. Uh, and, uh, and his thesis was that these were two sides of the same fundamental American individualistic ethos. One carried out culturally and morally, the other carried out economically. And he, his, his, his thesis was that is where we are We've, we've been stuck there for a long time until someone has come up with an answer for it uh, that can put back uh, a greater sense of the common good. We're struggling with this, and I would, I would assume that part of that struggle um, uh, has resulted in, in the election of, uh, of Mr. Trump. And, uh, and I certainly agree that you shouldn't go around uh, cursing Trump in public, maybe in private. You know, but let me just be Insist that you know uh, when when Fred describes liberalism as this essentially secular, elitist, technocratic political movement, how did it come to, in a sense, take over the American left? To some extent, I mean, of course, one can talk about the Reagan and libertarianism, but it's true that the Democratic Party seems to be dominated by this kind of ideology. Is it not, in some sense? How did that happen? I don't know. You want to I, say something? I, I think it's a much more mixed than that. I mean, uh, there are, you know, there are plenty of religious people who uh, uh, are still sympathetic to uh, to the Democrats. Uh, they nominated for president a very preachy Methodist last time around. Uh, it's uh, it's not uh, uh, that's where she was coming from. I think when it comes to the question of secularism, uh, you, there there are different kinds of secular. There's there's a secularism that is opposed to religion, wants to exclude religion from the public square. And then there's a secularism that wants to insist on, on, on a certain sense of neutrality among religions in the public square. I think both are are still alive. I, I wouldn't disagree that uh, when it comes to the Democratic Party, it, it tends to lean 
in a direction that I oppose. Uh, but uh, you, you never get every, you never get everything you want from from obviously from the political party. Okay. Uh, also, because uh, another thing that in the book is kind of uh, on the margins is the all you know liberal Protestant tradition in some sense because you answer correctly liberal Protestants were more associated with progressive you know, the social gospel was more uh, at the same time I would say that well into the fifties and sixties uh, the the Liberal, American liberal Protestant was a major social force in you know, yes. the mainstream. How was it possible that on that background, kind of again, the liberals took over in some sense? I mean, you know what I mean? What, what happened to that old tradition? Why did it, was it completely unable to, in a sense, resist to what you described? Uh, one of the few good things I can say about Obama is that he liked to quote Reinhold Niebuhr. And uh, Niebuhr was the last major important Protestant theologian. Um, American Protestantism uh, has not fared well in the last uh, last 50 years. Um, uh, its its pews have been emptying out, and and it's been replaced by by an, an evangelicalism, which is not not always to my liking. Uh, 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 that said, uh, again, uh, war has a great deal to do with this. Uh, not only Vietnam, but a, mis a misguided uh, war in, in Iraq uh, also had a terrible effect on American Protestantism. Uh, but let me, let me leave, leave this aside for a second. Uh, as a practicing Jew who's, who's anchored uh, who's anchored in, 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 in the Hebrew calendar I have a strong sense that without uh, without a connection to faith uh, we have a hard time living a meaningful life but the millennials, uh, which my wife will now cringe as I, as I repeat what I've said to her so many times, the dumbest generation in the history of the cosmos. Most fantastically, um, they're, they're, they're beyond all understanding. Uh, they're, they're not connected to family, they're not connected to faith, they're not connected to their country. We have terrible problems ahead of us. As for the Methodists who ran for president, uh, I, I, I worked with, I worked for the DLC, the Democratic Leadership Council, in the 1990s. I spent time face to face with Hillary. That she was a Methodist is someone, something I never guessed until it was useful for her to, men, to mention. When she ran for the Senate, she brought Jan and I in to, to, to help her, to help guide her in, in regard to New York State. Again, I never had the slightest slightest sense sense of these things. She's a Methodist when it's when it's useful to her to pretend she's a Methodist. I don't think it has much to do much 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 to do with it. As for Donald Donald Trump, and, and you know we, we don't we don't we don't even want to go there. <laughs> okay, thank you. I could ask a few more questions, but if there is uh, somebody from the audience who wants to start, yeah, want to speak up. Yeah, or yeah, um, yeah I wonder if I could ask a, a question of each speaker. Um, of course, I'd, I'd ask uh, Professor Siegel. I, I read your book, um, and I liked it very much, very interesting. Um, it reminded me of two other books I had read. One in college, um, uh, The New Radicalism in America, the, uh, Kit Lash. And, so, and, and Lash's last book, The Revolt Against the Elites. The difference, though, with Lash, Lash um, was always very skeptical. Well, he shared your, your um, dismay at the elitist tendencies of liberalism, he was also very skeptical of unchecked markets and the power of corporate capital, capitalism, luxury, accumulation of wealth. And uh, I'm just wondering, uh, and, and toward the end of his life, he was interested in populism, he was interested in Henry George, 
I'm kind of wondering where you stand economically. Do you see yourself in, in some dialogue with Lash, and where you uh, see your, yourself economically in relation to that? Um, and then I just, for uh, 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 Mr. Bauman, uh, um, your, criti your criticism of, of Professor Siegel was that his description of liberalism really only described a fringe minority. So if we would accept uh, the New York Times as a mainstream liberal institution and paper, what are your thoughts about where the New York Times is, is headed and, and what that tells us about contemporary American liberalism? So those are my two questions, one for Press Siegel and one for Ms. Mountain. But just quickly, I think, I think that's acute. Uh, I, I, I knew uh, Kit Lash, I was friends with Kit Lash. Uh, uh, he died, he, he died, however, uh, 25 year, more than 25 years ago, unfortunately. Uh, uh, I, 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 I wonder what he would think now. And the last book where he wrote, he wrote, uh, True and Only Heaven, was scattershot. It was, it, it, it was, it was, it was problematic. Um, uh, as for myself, uh, I try to convince the people in the Bernie Sanders campaign to talk about the monopolies in Silicon Valley. I would very much like to see the, the, the Justice Department, if, if they weren't so fantastically corrupt, uh, deal, deal with, 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 with the monopolies in Silicon Valley. They were, they're much more powerful than Wall Street at this point. And I try to convince, I try to convince Sanders, who's not the brightest ball, uh, to, 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 when he, every time he attacked Wall Street, one out of every three times mentioned Silicon Valley, because they're more powerful, they're more important. Uh, and I, I talked to people high up in his campaign, and I had no, I had no effect whatsoever, uh, no effect whatsoever. So my personal viewpoint, I, I, I want to see, I don't want to see Silicon Valley dominate American politics. They have so much money now. They're buying up so many companies. They're so consequential. As, as far as I'm concerned, they're a major threat. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, and I, I just I wonder if, if Lash was alive, what he what he what he would think about that. Uh, it, Lash actually wrote for Commonwealth uh, quite often, and uh, several of the essays. First appeared in um, uh, As far as the New York Times goes, uh, there are different parts to the New York Times. Uh, I, I don't. Um, I find much of the what is often referred to as the correctness of the New York Times to be exasperating and misleading. Uh, I tend to agree with its support of Keynesian economics, uh, with its. Uh, Warnings about uh, uh, Trump's foreign policy and stuff like that. I I am an avid reader of uh, for Ross Talbot. I think he's a very interesting uh, columnist. I'm not much of a fan of uh, Maureen Dow, uh, so <laughs> that's my take on it. Okay. Um, I think if you gather together a hundred liberals in the room um, and you ask them, what are the great triumphs of liberalism? In the last century, great many of them would say Roe versus Wade. So, what's your view of that poll? What's my view of Roe versus Wade? Well, uh, uh, as, as a liberal economist and, and as an, an example of the liberal attitude. Um, Commonweal objected to the Roe decision when it came out. We all along objected to the Democratic Party's pro uh, choice uh, positions. Uh, uh, we think that it's, a, it's been a fatal, it's been a fatal mistake. For the Democrats uh, to uh, to make that a uh, uh, litmus test uh, for for, uh, for the party and for the coalitions that they, they need to put together. Um, so uh, you know when I when I think uh, of liberalism's accomplishments over the past fifty years, uh, I inevitably think of you know civil rights, uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, you know that seems to be Certainly, one of the high watermarks when it comes to those accomplishments. It was, a, it was something I studied in college, and it was, it, it was just astonishing. You know, his his bravery, what he was faced with, uh, and how uh, he continued to push uh, uh, for integration integrationist model. Uh, I thought uh, 
think that was sort of my life. Why would you call it? Would you call Martin Luther King a liberal? Yes. What do you think about that? Uh, I, I would agree. I just want to describe uh, uh, something that actually happened. Uh, Jan and I were there. Uh, it was the 50th anniversary of uh, the magazine Telos. I don't know how many people are aware of, aware of Telos. It's the only German language publication written in English. Uh, it's a highbrow magazine. And uh, there was just a, they just had a 50th anniversary issue. Uh, and the one before that was on Martin Luther King and, and natural law. And at the 50th anniversary party, uh, where I'm pleased to say my youngest son, Jake, was the speaker, gave a talk on Ernst Junger, uh, his service in Iraq, and, and Telos. You, you try to put those three things together, you're good. Um, uh, it was a, an extraordinary figure in the room. I, we, didn't know who, we didn't know who he was at the time. Loud, booming, preacher voice. And all of a sudden, he'd sound like an intellectual. All of a sudden, he'd sound like he'd talk in a ghetto voice. It was like a one-man drama show. It was, it was just extraordinary. And he was making the case that ever since Martin Luther King had been secularized by liberals, the black community had been badly hurt. And I think, I think, that's, I think that's, that's right. That was the high point, 1968. Very little good is that the great society has been a disaster over time. That was the high point. And what, what and this, this turned to, we found out the next day that the, the gentleman speaking was a man named Eugene Rivers. Some of you may know him, a, 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 a Protestant preacher from, from Boston. He was the man, he wrote a very famous article called making fun of, of, of Cornell West and, and Skip Gates called uh, Black Intellectuals in the Age of Cocaine. And, and what he talked about is how he, he, brought, he, he got the gangs, the Boston gangs, to, to lay down their arms. And while Black Intellectuals were talking about the Frankfurt School, which Telos, unfortunately, was a big promoter of it at one point. Uh, his, his argument is, that, that the future of, of black reform, small r, lies in the revival of, of the importance of the, of the black church. And I'm very, I'm very sympathetic to that. When I, when I talk to people about that, uh, I get blank stares. Any more questions? Go ahead. Both of you have spoken uh, just a bit to uh, the issues of globalization. Um, I almost uh, form a, uh, a takeaway that uh, besides uh, uh, eviscerating uh, the, the unions and the, uh, the middle class, uh, perhaps the, the thesis lies that globalization has this, this uh, has eviscerated the ability to have this common real connection because of the, of the fact that we are speaking uh, with global economic forces that um, eliminate uh, this place where people can meet and ideas um, set a, a, a liberal agenda, a liberal democratic agenda. Um, and I, I guess uh, um, help me uh, if, if you could develop your thoughts more that. Uh, would address where globalization is uh, uh, confronting liberalism. Let me, let me just let me pick this up in terms of Wells. This Wells was a great was a great globalist. He sought global global go, uh, government. Uh, Obama was, was an, a globalist, an internationalist. Um, it's not just here in America. It's much of Europe. Nationalism which gets denounced as neo-fascism, blank, blankety-blank. Uh, democracy does well in a nation, in a nation state. It, it, it can't do well in a global setting. In a global setting, coastal, coast, in America, coastal elites, the EU elites, I don't know if any of you have ever dealt with the bureaucrats of the EU. They're, they're really a rancid character, a group of 
uh, and they, they have no interest in, in dealing with the well-being of, of their populations. And so immigrate, immigration comes come, connects to this. Uh, if, if you're going to insist on open borders, whether it be Europe or America, and, and you're going to insist on globalization, you, don't, you have no basis for a, 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 for a national conversation, no basis for a national discussion. That's, that was my point about Hamilton before. Uh, and I, I think that, that it, it, so far as in America, so far as the Democrats, insist on, on open borders, they're going to have terrible problems uh, uh, down the road. And by the way, in Europe, it, it's very similar. Angela Merkel uh, is, in, is, in, is in bad trouble in her own party. The, the, the Bavarian so, uh, the Christian uh, Democratic Party is essentially breaking away from her, not fully, but functionally. Well, globalization is, is, is a very big topic uh, that uh, I'm not fully qualified to address. Uh, I guess I would, uh, one thing I would say, however, that um, uh, there is, you know, it seems to be a fact of life that the economic system that uh, we have and that we benefited from uh, has a lot to do with what they used to call creative destruction. Uh, there seems to be a lot of creative destruction in, in this economy and in globalization. Uh, and that creates insecurity uh, among people. And uh, people, uh, in order to form families, uh, in order to form communities or unions, uh, they need some stability. Uh, and to the extent uh, that uh, globalization uh, doesn't allow for that, I think it does introduce a certain degree of, uh, of insecurity and threat to democracy. Um, uh, two more questions, one in the back and one in the front. So I grew up in a family that espoused the type of liberalism that you were talking about, Mr. Malcolm. And I found that when I went to college, I was taught that that type of liberalism wasn't liberal enough. And I think you know, it fit more of the progressive ideal that you were talking about, Mr. Siegel. And I, I realized a lot of it centered around you know, the big three, race, class, and gender. And I was told by most of my classmates that my opinion wasn't valid because I was a white male an upper middle class family. And it was confusing because I thought that I I agreed with most of them on, on most topics, but because of this fixation on race, class, and gender, you know, my voice wasn't really taken seriously. And I saw during this last election, people who look like me, people who have the same background, found Trump to be this kind of self-effect figure who was you know, speaking for the, you know, the forgotten white man. But I, for, for me, I mean, looking at the background that I came from, I, you know, I didn't see that to be a reasonable option. But now I'm left with this, this kind of strange position of wanting to be part of what I would consider a traditional democratic liberal ideal. But I feel like there's very little space, especially for you know, a religious, traditional liberal. Um, and I, I contemplated looking at some of the third parties. And I've also thought about just forgetting about politics. Um, but it, it's a real question for me and a lot of friends of mine. You know, is it worth you know, trying to stay involved in the Democratic Party? Is it worth trying to be involved in the third party just for getting? Um, I wonder if you can comment on that. You make some good questions. What you need is a subscription to Common Room Magazine. So I said that. <laughs> that will bring great solace. Uh, politics is, is tough. Uh, I think uh, I, I, I can't imagine how frustrating it must have been uh, for uh, people to say that uh, you're not allowed to have an opinion on a question because you're white, because you're male. Uh, that was, uh, this phenomenon uh, was to a certain extent true when I was in college as well. Uh, certainly when it came to racial questions, uh, we were not, white undergraduates were not allowed to have an opinion on things that uh, black undergraduates uh, wanted to weigh in on. So it's not, this is not entirely new. Uh, it, this sort of uh, silliness has been around for a long time. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I mean, you, there, are, uh, there, there are unions uh, that are still working to uh, pull people up out of, uh, from the working class into the middle class. Uh, 
that's one place to enter into politics. Uh, uh, and I think, um, uh, you know, lo local politics uh, is, uh, is not necessarily uh, as, as riven as national politics on these questions. Although I was an editorial writer at a regional paper for five years, and local politics is all about personalities, <laughs> much more than it is about philosophy. Uh, so that's fair one there. So what college did you go to? Went to Florida Manhattan. Florida Manhattan. Florida Manhattan. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a mess. I, I think we're living through the long 60s. I think the, the, the the fractures that occurred in the 60s were never healed. They, they, they widened, uh, they putrefied, and, and, and we're still living with them. We don't, and we're far from, from dealing with them. And um, I'm not optimistic about the unions because the unions have become increasingly public sector. And the public sector unions get their cut no matter whether the economy does well or not. And, uh, I don't know what I think about this Janus case. This, this is the case com coming up with, with, uh, uh, with uh, it's a right to work case. Excuse me, right to work. Thank you. The right to work case. I'm, 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 I'm probably, I'm, I'm just ambivalent about it. Um, the, but, but globalization is, is not something that's just felt here. It, some, it hasn't been covered by by the geniuses of the New York Times. Let me, let me, let me stop. My wife will shoot. It hasn't been covered by the quote-unquote journalists of the New York Times, but there's a guy named Doug Ford, uh, so-called Trump of the North, who's just, just been elected to the premiership of the largest province in Canada, Ontario. And he's a nationalist. He sounds very much like Trump without the nastiness. In other words, this is not, Trump is not peculiar. <laughs> That's I, I have to go home. Uh, Trump, Trump is not is not unique. Trump's policies. Let me let me rephrase this. Like all, Trump's policies are not unique. Uh, there's a lot criti criticizing the, in, in the Law and Justice Party in Poland. A lot. They're a nasty piece of work in many ways, but in other ways they 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 understand certain things and they get certain things right. The same with, with Orban's nationalists in, in, in Hungary. The, the same with, 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 with the Czechs and the so-called Visegrad uh, uh, group. Uh, the, the, uh, in, in here, it, it's, it's the coastal elites uh, doing well of globalization. And you know, you, we talk about creative destruction, but creative destruction didn't create uh, uh, jobs in America. It just destroyed. And and the, the, the people at uh, Apple uh, transferred all the jobs overseas. And they got they got adulatory coverage in the pages pages of the New York Times. Uh, so I'm not I'm not I'm not optimistic about about uh, uh, what comes forward. Uh, if I read the Los Angeles Times, it's the same. It's the same kind of thing. I want to see. I want to see people begin to talk intelligently about the power of monopoly. Google is a monopoly. Three hundred people from Google worked in the Obama White House. They were joined at the hip. Neither of them. Well, Google came out came out very well. Obama White House not nearly so well. I want, I want to see I want to see something done to control these characters because you can't have any creativity if the companies are so wealthy they can buy up their competitors almost immediately. Anyway, let me stop this. I'm going to get in the soapbox. Okay, uh, very good. So uh, I don't know when that's to conclude when Fred was talking about the long 1960s.
I was thinking of the author, I translated the translated this Italian philosopher from the 60s, because when I read him, it looked like nothing changed. It looked like our culture, in some sense, fell into a rut in the 1960s, and then some things stuck. And the one that struck me the most about reading this guy was this idea that what calls itself liberalism is basically what we call it aristocracy of intelligence, meaning a technocracy. Yes. Which, which is based on ultimately on a deep faith that we can create our own reality. But even before being individualistic, there's this deep faith in our ability to create our own world, you know, create our own reality, create our own moral value. You know. I was struck because when you talk about Nietzsche as one of the authors of liberalism, because now don't kill me, but the one thing I, since I've been in America, I've been reminded once of Nietzsche, and it was during Obama's first inaugural address. <laughs> It can sound very weird, but there was this sense of an optimistic faith that we can create our own values, create our own values. Now, in light of this, so 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 what, it, what my, my my sense is that we are not facing, you know, the 500 trajectory of the Enlightenment, the Hobbes and Locke. We are facing a precisely 20th century scientific technocratic hybrids in some sense. Now, my question is. My final question is, how strong is it? Is it really as strong as it seems to be? Because you know there are people like Rod Dreher, for instance, who have this sense that this ideology is going to steamroll all of us in some sense. You know, that it is triumphant and ultimately uh, unstoppable. You know that. What do you see coming down the pike in the next few years? That, that's my last question. You go first. Uh, I'm afraid I, I largely agree with him. I, 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 uh, because there's a cl the class dimension of this is the upper middle class uh, is doing very well. Uh, they they send their they send their kids to the best schools. Not a, they, the kids might come out of schools knowing absolutely nothing, um, you know. But they get they have the credentials. They meet they, they meet the right people, and, and and they and they move on and they move on in life. Uh, but you know, there's a there's a book, a book that's pretty familiar with a, a woman named Selena Zito. She wrote a very good book on, on the 2016 campaign, and what she did was uh, uh, she did uh, she combined uh, political science uh, uh, surveys with with uh, shoe leather. She went and interviewed people in, in the midwestern states that Hillary didn't want to visit, uh, and. And what she saw was people who lived uh, uh, within a diverse framework, but it wasn't the race, class, gender of diversity. It was class diversity. So they, they belonged to clubs or clubs and organizations where they, they might be upper middle class, but they, work, they, they, they belonged to the Cancer Society or the Rotary Club, <laughs> the source of Sinclair Lewis's fascism, uh, where they knew people who were working class or middle class. And it's a very different world. Uh, and that kind of diversity is enormously healthy. And that's, that's what I'm afraid is, is, is lost in the, coast, in the coastal cities. Um, I don't know about uh, the Nietzschean technocratic future, how close uh, that is. I think our more pressing problems are more immediate uh, and uh, have to do with President Trump and, uh, and uh, you know, and certain democratic norms. Uh, I think uh, we're going to have to uh, deal with that uh, before we uh, before we get to those uh, longer term problems. I, I do. I, I certainly agree with Fred that um, I think uh, operations like Google and Apple are too big, uh, and there's not enough competition. And that used to be a pretty basic conservative value uh, that uh, monopolies are not a good thing. Uh, so. Uh, I think that's an important point. Okay, thank you very much. Please.